And now for the second time, we'll check uh, to our third lecture uh, about pulmonary embolism response scheme, the concept in changing the paradigm of the BE management with our eminent speaker, Dr. Sarwat Isa. Uh, Dr. Sarwat uh, is senior clinical fellow, uh, critical care medicine, Manchester uh, Royal Infirmary, Manchester Foundation Trust, UK. Uh, his lecture uh, about uh, pulmon uh, pulmonary embolism response scheme, a novel approach for complex BE patients. Actually, it's a great honor uh, to have you with us today, Dr. Sarwat. And now the mic is yours. Thank you, Dr. Sheikh, for the nice presentation. And I'm really delighted uh, today to participate in uh, with this great team uh, and this really interesting and fascinating uh, webinar about the pulmonary embolism. Thank you, Dr. Aslan and Dr. Hassan Tomi. Um, and I'm really pleased uh, to be with you uh, tonight and to see you again. Uh, so uh, I know that the third lecture and maybe the people uh, uh, started to run away, but I, I will try to be as quick as uh, possible and to the target. So I have nothing to disclose really, and uh, I will try to answer uh, those uh, three questions. Why basically uh, do we need the pulmonary embolism response team? And what is that? And how can we set up uh, a pulmonary embolism response team? Uh, so, uh, so starting uh, uh, from a clinical and practical uh, uh, point of view, starting with this uh, three uh, scenarios, uh, which are real scenarios really from our daily practice. And you guys might have uh, seen such patients in your uh, daily activity. Uh, the first case is a 67-year-old chap with no previous medical history who was being presented with uh, a shortness of breath over the last five days. Uh, on examination, he's quite tachycardic, hypotensive, uh, 95 over 50, hypoxic, um, and uh, he has had a CT pulmonary angio, which showed a bilateral pulmonary embolism. Uh, urgent bedside echo uh, showed uh, a severely dilated and hypokinetic RV with interventricular septal flattening uh, and also a mobile uh, thrombus in uh, the right atrium. Uh, th this is clot and transient. So he has definitely RV strain and RV dysfunction. Um, and that was his CT pulmonary uh, angio showed, uh, you can see the arrows here. Uh, pointing at the clots in the pulmonary trunk. This is a very big clots. Um, on the right side of the screen, you can see uh, apical four chamber view for echocardiography of this patient, the arrow pointing at the clot. And you can see also the RV is uh, hugely dilated and the symptom is almost flat. Uh, so um, in this scenario, uh, what should you do for the desperate man? Uh, what are the available options? and uh, what is the available evidence and the guidelines. Already we have discussed over the last uh, um, session and today some of these guidelines and available options already. So uh, what do you guys think? Can, how can we help this man? Uh, I hope you can be interactive with me and you can share your thoughts in the chat box or even unmute yourself and tell me uh, what do you think? What are your thoughts? All right, for the sake of time, I will uh, just go to the second scenario. Um, a 50 years old the patient whose history of diabetes, hypertension, and high BMI. Uh, he has been admitted with community acquired pneumonia and septic shock treated accordingly, and he was ready for the weaning. However, he has had acute respiratory distress. He became hypoxemic. Oxygen requirements and the NORAD requirements have gone up. Uh, and the team thinks it is acute pulmonary embolism as ruled out all other causes. What should you do in this situation? Um, is it sensible to send him down for uh, CT and you? Uh, is it safe for him to go down? What do you think? Maybe one of you will say, um, I'm gonna thrombolize him. Maybe one will say, no, I have to do some more workup. 
Um, the third situation is a 25 year old uh, patient with high BMI with no other comorbidities who came in with shortness of breath, a little bit of tachycardia and tachypnea, otherwise stable, and the CTB showed a saddle implus and RV dilatation. The AD team called ITU for admission uh, as high risk patient, which was very sensible consultation. Um, and because he might deteriorate furthermore and he might need the reperfusion therapy at some stage. Uh, they started already on therapeutic heparin and uh, the patient has been shifted to the HDU. At night, he has deteriorated in terms of oxygen requirements and significant trombone leak as well. The physic heart should are restrained better than pulmonary artery pressure of 65. This is another challenge situation. So what should you do for this patient? Okay, um, always there is a gray zone, uh, either in life or uh, in medicine. Uh, however, uh, you cannot say 100% uh, where to go and uh, you cannot decide 100% the correct decision or you need some support from the evidence or uh, um, robust data to support or to assist your decision. And this area in the pulmonary embolism is the intermediate risk pulmonary embolism. Um, as you guys know from the previous session and from uh, the presentations today that it's crystal clear the management for the massive or the high risk, it's crystal clear for the low risk, Despite there is still some controversies around uh, and the, the data behind the evidence is uh, sometimes controversial. Um, but the intermediate risk BE is the gray zone in pulmonary embolism field. Uh, one of the studies and it's been highlighted already by Dr. Hassan in the previous uh, presentation is the BETHO trial. Um, simply, they compare the anticoagulation versus anticoagulation plus thrombolytic therapy for patients with, with intermediate risk of pulmonary embolism. And they looked at the risk of bleeding uh, uh, as outcome and all cause mortality and the secondary outcome of the mortality related to the BE. The, you can see there is a significant increase in the risk of bleeding in the patients who have received the anticoagulation plus thrombolytic therapy, um, and the all-cause mortality and the hemodynamic decompensation at seven days uh, has improved uh, significantly with those patients, the all-cause mortality. However, the mortality related to the B at seven days and at 30 days, there was no significant difference really. That's why the three available guidelines, the ACCB guidelines 2016, the American Heart Association, and the latest version of guidelines from European Society of Cardiology and European Respiratory Society 2019 um, uh, um, as uh, just a, a debriefing for these guidelines in terms of uh, thrombolysis and the management for such category of patients. I, I am focusing here on the intermediate risk pulmonary embolism. Uh, so uh, you can see here there is different categories and uh, uh, of, of uh, and the classes of uh, evidence uh, to say yes uh, for uh, thrombolysis for the intermediate high risk pulmonary embolism and it is conditioned by certain circumstances and it should be a case by case scenario and also they highlighted the castor directed therapy for such patients. So there is a still a controversy and which modality is the best for such patient category really, and still it is a gray zone. Um, you can see here, see here some uh, therapeutic options all over the map for the pulmonary embolism. And uh, of those uh, modalities are the IV thrombolysis, the castor directed therapy, the ECMO, the surgical embolectomy, uh, IVC filter placement and anticoagulation. And, uh, all of these modalities needs different stakeholders or uh, specialities to decide which one is the best for my patient. And you might need to consult multiple specialities uh, to decide which option is the best for my patient, really. 
Um, so uh, the best treatment is really unknown and the no standardized approach to date. And the strategies all over the map, uh, still uh, the practice is very variable among the medical services and it differs between locations and the departments according to the facilities available and the expertise. Um, and still there is no consistency in decision making regarding whether to thrombolize or not to thrombolize to anticoagulate or not to anticoagulate. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we, we have a patient who, and uh, uh, two fellows in the same duty. One of them said, I will stick with anticoagulation and the other said, I know I will thrombolize this patient. And every one of them has his own rationale. Uh, so uh, you, you might need a team uh, uh, to, to make a consensus decision for this patient rather than one-man show or single decision-making. Um, and still no centralized locations for care or centers for excellence for the pulmonary embolism. Uh, and still we are lacking some evidence and some systematic evaluations of the results we have uh, from uh, the patients who uh, have been admitted with pulmonary embolism. Uh, still, there is gaps in the treatment of pulmonary embolism, and uh, I think that's been highlighted already by Dr. Adil in the previous uh, session. Uh, there is minority of patients with pulmonary embolism might receive a very advanced therapy, while the majority who are eligible to receive this therapy might not have uh, received that such as therapy. Um, and the reasons may be just a fear of complications, the catastrophic complications like intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, or maybe it is a system issues like inability to respond appropriately uh, to the cold that my patient has a massive or high risk BE, uh, or just a failure to recognize the potential benefits of the therapeutic modalities you have, or a failure to integrate the data in appropriate time, and that will lead to paralysis in decision making. Um, here's some, uh, uh, I will just highlight some uh, uh, data from uh, the studies, pre post birth studies, and this is one of the most interesting one from Mass General Hospital. Um, th th that was a hospital uh, in which the bird has been born really in the US, like eight years ago or so. Uh, so uh, some uh, data in, uh, it is a retrospective observational uh, study. Uh, they looked at the mortality pre and the post birth implementation. And you can, you can see here the all cause mortality at 30 days on the left side, the green arrows pre birth, it's rising. And on the right side, the green arrow is decreasing. This means the mortality post birth is much lower than the mortality pre-birth in different categories of pulmonary embolism. Um, another pre post um, birth studies published in the thrombosis and thrombolysis in 2019 uh, just looked at some uh, similar data um, and um, increased efficacy and utilization of advanced therapeutic options for the pulmonary embolism. Um, and they looked at the pre-birth and the post-birth in terms of time uh, to diagnosis of pulmonary embolism or the triage to heparin or the time to administer the anticoagulation. And that was the modalities studied in this study, either the ECMO and the castor directed therapy, the plus 10% of the patients and some other uh, data. Um, another study uh, highlighted the impact of the BERT uh, on the availability and the management and the outcome of pulmonary embolism. And I'm going to focus here on the intermediate high risk pulmonary embolism. And you can see pre BERT and the post BERT comparison in terms of the time to uh, anticoagulation and uh, uh, the major uh, hemorrhage incidence. And there is significant a really reduction in the time needed to anticoagulate such patients. And there is also a significant improvement or significant reduction in the risk of catastrophic bleeding. This means that the, the birth is simply good. Pre-post uh, birth outcomes, another uh, up to date, I think 2021, 
uh, publishing the thrombosis from lysis journal. Also, uh, they looked at the in-hospital mortality and the length of stay of uh, pulmonary embolism patients who are intermediate high risk or high risk. And there is a significant reduction in the mortality from 37 to 29%. Um, I think it's clear that why we need BERT now I think uh, I answered this, and let's go to the next question. What's BERT? BERT is simply is a team, the same like rapid response team or the heart team. So it is a multidisciplinary team, uh, provides a consensus and unified plan, which improves efficacy over traditionally consulted different subspecialties. You might have a patient with intermediate risk, and you are really struggling whether to thrombolize, whether to just anticoagulate, uh, should I refer him to the Dr. Aslan for castor directed therapy? Should I refer him to the cardiac surgeon for uh, thrombectomy? Or should I refer him to the ECMO team for a possibility of ECMO? So you are thinking in just a kind of five different disciplines and how to gather all these uh, uh, specialities together, or you, you might need some 10 to 12 hours or less or more according to the facility and the department and the availability of the people around uh, in order just to have a unified or a consensus decision, safe decision for your patient, whether to anticoagulate or, or thrombolize him. But if you have a BERT, you will just activate the BERT. And the BERT will take over the job. Within 30 minutes or one hour, you will have a unified consensus decision. So you will have a centralized, unique activation uh, if you have a BERT. And the BERT will rapidly assess and uh, risk stratify the patient. And the BERT will individualize the treatment approach. This means it is, uh, the BERT will assess every patient as a case-by-case -case scenario. They will review the recommendations, they will review the available guidelines, and they will support the decision with evidence. Uh, and whenever you just activate the BERT, the BERT will take over the job from you. For example, if you activated the BERT and you have interventional radiologist in the BERT, so uh, he will activate uh, the, the radiology suite for castor directed therapy. If you need to do uh, uh, open thrombectomy for your patient, the cardiac surgeon will activate the process and so on. So implementation of variable treatment strategies um, can be carried out by the BERT. Um, of the interesting websites, you can just have a look at the BERT consortium that's born on 2015, I believe. Yeah, just eight years ago, and they have an uh, annual meeting, and those multiple teams gather uh, and share their experiences with their own local BERT teams, and they will come up by some recommendations and some data and they, they might publish also some data on the website. You can just have a look and Google it. It's a very interesting website. Uh, from background, the point of view, uh, as I mentioned, BERT is just the extrapolation of the two operational concepts and the systems, which are the rapid response team and the heart team. And it is proven in the evidence that implementation of the rapid response team has reduced the mortality in hospital mortality by 12% and the in-hospital cardiac arrest by almost 35% or so. So assembling a team of multiple specialities that's initially started in Mass General Hospital in the US and they published their 30 months of experience in the uh, chest journal, they, they managed to uh, have 315, uh, 314 BEs over the 30 months. Um, some of them are low risk, some of them are intermediate risk, uh, almost 45%, and the high risk category is almost 25%. Uh, they managed to thrombolize 11% of their patients and anticoagulate 69% only of their patients. Uh, so I think uh, BERT is a paradigm was rapidly adopted and could be a standard of care for pulmonary embolism. Um, interestingly, um, 
one of the findings I, I could highlight here as the major bleeding according to the therapeutic options, which was around 12.5% overall. But if you looked at here, post birth, uh, prior to birth and the post birth, prior to birth is 45%. So there is a significant reduction really uh, from 45% to 12.5% uh, after birth implementation. So this means birth is still good. Um, how to set up a team? Um, it's the first time to be highlighted in the European Society of Cardiology um, guidelines in the version of 2019. They just highlighted the team member. And it is really an example why, because you might not have all of these disciplines in your hostel. So it is, it is just adaptation of the multiple specialities together in uh, the hostel settings. Uh, it might include the cardiologist, the pulmonologist, the IR, the hematology, the vascular, cardiothoracic, anesthesia, or intensive care. Um, uh, from the BERT consortium, they just have published uh, a survey of 22 out of 31 teams worldwide uh, in terms of the specialists who are sharing in the BERT team. And you can see on the top is the pulmonary and crit care. And next is the interventional cardiologist and the emergency medicine followed by cardiac, interventional radiology, hematology, and vascular surgeon as well. This is an example of the BERT flow chart, uh, just to know guys how the process uh, is going through uh, the BERT uh, activation and the process. Uh, if you have a patient who is very sick with acute pulmonary embolism, uh, either in AD or in ICU even, or in inpatient service, uh, the BERT team activation is uh, just carried out through a Beijing system. And I'm pretty sure that it is very easy to gather nowadays through any of the platforms well known to us, like uh, the Zoom or the Teams. Every day we have MDT meeting through the Teams for everything you can imagine. And the BERT activation by on-call physician, uh, so they can gather either in person or via video conference call. And all those specialists around, they will discuss uh, the available workup, the images, the patient history, risk stratification, and available guidelines. And they will come up with a uh, consensus decision whether to uh, do this therapeutic option is uh, suitable for this patient. And they will relay this recommendation to the patient, his family, and they can discuss with the parent team as well and come up with action. Uh, another example from Cleveland the Clinic uh, um, uh, for the, the process of the birth and setup. If you have a patient with severe pulmonary embolism who can activate the ER, the ICU, the regular nursing staff, or even the radiologist. Um, and uh, one of the senior uh, team, and should be a senior one who uh, knows very well the policy of the birth or the pulmonary embolism and uh, how the birth works, gonna assist the patient, either the vascular in this model, the vascular medicine or the palm critical care fellow, and he's, he's gonna assist the patient. And it's just a, a focused assessment, uh, just uh, calculate the SBC, do some bloods, specifically the biomarkers. You can do a, a bedside echo to have a look on the RV, and you can request a CT pulmonary angio if it is indicated, and uh, you can do just a checklist for the lysis contraindication. Then he will relay this uh, uh, picture and uh, results of the work up to the team, and the team is gonna um, uh, gather or see the patient in person at the bedside or virtually through uh, any platform, and they will come up with uh, specific recommendations within a time frame of 180 minutes or so. This is another model, almost the same. And uh, in terms of uh, implementation issues and the challenges, really, uh, uh, it is in the literature, uh, they are talking about the logistics because you have multiple uh, disciplines, uh, dis disciplines and the stakeholders in the team. So you have to uh, adapt 
the team according to the facility and the departmental needs uh, and the availabilities of uh, the multiple specialties. The meeting, I think it is uh, not a logistic issue after the COVID uh, pandemic era. Uh, who will assist the patient? This is another dilemma, but usually a senior one could be from the intensive care or uh, from the vascular team or from the pulmonology team who was uh, in situ in the hospital. Uh, potential overuse of the, of the novel techniques, it is unlikely in the research. And uh, I'm just highlighting this, uh, the KMC, King Abdullah Medical City Birth Project, uh, I, I, I have initiated with Dr. Adil in 2019, uh, after we have uh, implemented the protocol for the BE management in the hospital. And we started already the process of uh, birth and we uh, presented some of our data in the last uh, European Society of Intensive Care Medicine Conference 2021. And we published some data also in the European uh, Society of Intensive Care Journal. Uh, and this is our flu chart at KMC uh, for the pair to work up. It looks like a sophisticated one, but it is not. Uh, just, just simply because it is not only for the management, it's for the diagnosis and the management. It's a very straightforward one. But again, this is adapted to the KMC hospital uh, facility availabilities and available expertise. And you can see here highlighted in, uh, in red when to activate the BERT, like in BE related cardiac arrest or uh, the high risk BE or uh, the patient with intermediate high risk pulmonary embolism. Uh, so back to our first scenario, sudden embolus and RV dysfunction, if you guys remember, uh, just the emergency department team discussed as administering the systemic uh, thrombolytic therapy for this patient, but they had a difficulty to find the guideline to assist the decision making uh, because still the blood pressure is borderline maybe because there is clot in transit and the guidelines didn't highlight what to do in a clot in transit, which is mobile through the, my, uh, the tricuspid valve in the RV and uh, right atrium. Uh, they uh, uh, thought about uh, cardiothoracic surgery for uh, possible surgical embolectomy, embolectomy, sorry, or interventional cardiology for castor directed therapy. However, they realized that they have birth in the hospital. So they decided to activate BERT within 30 minutes, all the subspecialties convened to evaluate the patient and they come up with a decision to go with percutaneous embolectomy and a 17 centimeter claw was removed on block. Three hours later, the patient developed the hypotension, which was vasopressor dependent. So they decided again to go with ultrasound facilitated catheter directed thrombolysis to dissolve the, rem the remnants of the clot. Seven days later, the patient has been discharged home with a plan of six months of anticoagulation. And interestingly, they have a BERT clinic as well for the follow up. So after three months, and the BERT clinic basically will uh, be uh, um, uh, will be attended by the pulmonologist and the vascular uh, one of the vascular team, and the patient uh, had a normal RV afterwards, and that was a thrombus retrieved from this the, this patient. Uh, so the BERT of BERT BERT is a rapid bedside evaluation and risk stratification. It helps really interpret the recommendations from three guidelines and facilitates access to advanced therapeutic options available in the facility. And of course, still we are behind and lacking the evidence and it is a very rich area for research if anybody is interested. This is some of our references and I'm happy to answer any questions related to Bert and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarwat, for this uh, fruitful comprehensive lecture. Uh, and uh, if we have any question for Dr. Sarwat. I think no question, Dr. Sarwat. Really, it was uh, clear and, to ta and with, target mes uh, with targeted message. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Unfortunately, our time is up. And we have to close.
uh, by the end. Uh, I'd like to thank you all, uh, our, spectral, uh, our respectable speakers, panelists, and, and, and attendees. Uh, with special thanks to our uh, Prof. Dr. Saad and Prof. Dr. Adel Hussein for, uh, for this, uh, their uh, time and effort. Uh, and hoping to see you all uh, again next week, inshallah, with our third day of this webinar uh, with our iconic professor, Dr. Adel Hussein, in an interactive session uh, entitled uh, ICU OSCI. Uh, hoping to see you soon.